I am Dana Krzyzewski. Um, if you're on the postdoc list, sir, if you've seen my name a million times, or perhaps met me once or twice. Um, very glad that you could join us here today. This is part of a regular series that we have from the Office of the Vice President of Research with uh, professional development presentations for postdocs, and, and very often we invite graduate students as well, so we're happy to be here today. Uh, can I just get a quick show of hands? How many of you are postdocs? How about graduate students? <coughs> How about something else? <laughs> okay, great. You're all welcome. Thank you for coming. Help yourselves to cookies and water. So um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Dr. Joanne Caymans. She received her PhD in genetics from Harvard Medical School. And then she spent 15 years at BSF Abbott, where she led discovery research projects on small molecule and antibody <coughs> approaches to inflammatory diseases. Ultimately, she served there as group leader in molecular biology. Then in 2007, she joined RXI Pharmaceuticals as director of discovery, and then she concluded there as senior director of research collaborations. Then in 2011, Dr. Kings became the executive director of AdGene, and she'll tell you some about that organization. It's a mission-driven nonprofit dedicated to helping scientists around the world to collaborate. Dr. Cavins founded the current Boston chapter of AWIS, and she was the director of the HBI Boston Mentoring Program for three years, and she serves on a number of other boards. In 2013, she was elected as fellow to the Massachusetts Academy of Science for service to, the science, to science and the community. So we'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Joanne Cavins. Thanks, Dana. All right, so um, you're here in the middle of the day. You left the labs because you're worried about work-life balance. And you're probably all sitting there going, God, I really have stuff to do, you know? So um, kudos to you for making the time to work on your soft skills. So I will tell you that this is used to be my most requested talk. About a couple years ago, I probably gave this talk about 30 times a year. Um, and it was one of the first talks I gave um, of all the different talks that I do on career development. But I will tell you, it is not my favorite talk because it's not really skills development. Because really, there is no choice. Because you're scientists or you're engineers. It's not like something you do, it's something you are. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to be happy. So basically, the answer, the bottom line to this whole talk is you just have to figure it out a way. Okay? But the idea is to use some of these tricks that, I'll, that I have gleaned from colleagues and friends and from myself. Um, to make it as painless as possible, and in fact, so that you can find the joy in both your home, so your non-work and your work life. Now, there are those rare people who only find the joy in work, and you know, all the power to them. Maybe, maybe they'll win great prizes and do great things. Um, but most of us, that is not the case. And most of you that are here, probably that is not the case. You have other things you want to do with your life aside from you know, scientific or engineering discoveries. So um, this talk is just a little bit um, about some ideas that you might want to think about, especially while you're early in your career and early in your lives. So, um, you know, I'm almost 50. I'll tell you a little bit about my family as we go along. I'm some, you know, a little past middle age now. And so, you know, telling you about some of the things that were important to me that I've enjoyed my career and have been able to enjoy a, a nice family and, and non-work life. So, um, this, uh, Dana talked a little bit about what I've done. Um, I'm not going to go into detail. That's kind of a different talk, my industry transition talk. I go into some of those arrows and how that happened. Um, but for this talk, this is kind of the more important part. Um, I had my son in graduate school. Um, it was a great time, actually, to have a kid. So very often at this talk, one of the questions I will be asked is, when's the right time to have children? My answer to that is, if you are in a stable relationship and you want to have children, it's always the right time to have children. So uh, my son's a junior here at MIT. I don't see him in the audience. That's probably good, because I talk about him a little bit in this talk. Um, and I'm very proud of him and very happy to be working near him and, and that he's doing great at school. Um, I've also always found time to do giving back stuff, which has come back to me a hundredfold. Um, I have done a lot of volunteer work for the last so over a decade now, um, probably a decade and a half. Um, and uh, that's been a very enriching part of my life. And, and now I get to do it as part of my job at AdGene. So I'll tell you a little bit about AdGene. So how many people here have heard of AdGene? How many people use plasmids in their research? Okay, so I'll do a little quick, quick thing on AdGene, because not everybody here it, it pertains to. but. 
Um, adgene is a repository for little circles of DNA called plasmids used by life scientists around the world. I'm on adgene time, so this is my public service announcement. My marketing team gets mad if I don't do this before I talk. So there's also some flyers you can bring back to your labs out on the table. So um, that's Blue Gene, our little mascot. Um, we're celebrating 10 years. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, there are all kinds of stuff going on this year as we celebrate our 10th year. We have 30,000 individual plasmids in the library. We shipped 95,000 plasmids last year. For those of you in life sciences, 12,000 of them were CRISPR plasmids, in case you're interested. We have the largest collection by far of anywhere in the world of CRISPR reagents and plasmids in the world. So if you're interested in genome engineering, you should go to our website. Um, we have tons, you know, almost 2,000 labs now involved in depositing to the library. It's free to deposit, so that's the mission. We want scientists to be able to share their materials. We ship to 78 countries. So we can do a much better job of reagent sharing than you can from your biology lab because you cannot ship to Australia and Russia and Qatar and Saudi Arabia and a small island off the coast of Spain, which are some of the places that we have shipped plasmids. Um, and we take care of all the work, so all the legal part, all the logistics. All you have to do is tell us what you have and give us a little bit of your DNA and we take care of the rest. So um, I, one, of the things, one of the reasons why I like to start my talks with this is um, we've just started a blog in honor of our anniversary this year. We're blogging about twice a week with a lot of things of interest to life scientists, but in general to scientists and people in STEM, we're also doing a lot of career um, blogging. And so all of my career blogging, which has been all over the internet, is now all on the Adgene blog. And so I just, I'm doing a series on mentoring, if that's of interest to you, where I'm going into depth into some of the things that I speak about, a um, little bit networking tips and other types of things will be on the blog. So you can sign up for alerts, you can follow the blog, you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn um, if you want to see what's coming out. Um, but there'll be a lot of um, pertinent information if you do any time on social media reading about soft skills. Um, the collection is vast. Um, we have everything, every organism, every type of reagent. It makes sense to look in the library. And if you can't find what you're looking for, to call our scientists. We have six PhD scientists that help you find what you're looking for. Um, and before you clone anything, it really makes sense to see if somebody cloned it already and did that, made that construct, because we have a lot of stuff. Um, we also have resources to help you choose plasmids and learn about plasmids and molecular biology and what's going on in the field, kind of endless resource pages. So if you are a scientist that generates something in your lab, I know scientists like data, I like data. So this is the line. If you deposit your materials in a biorepository, these are the um, citations you get for your paper. And if you do deposit in a repository, these are the citations you get. So merely on an impact factor, um, the data say that you should share your materials, and the more openly you do that, the better it is for your, for your career, actually, in academia and, um, and beyond. So um, that's my spiel on Adgene. If you have any questions, I'll be around after, and there's some flyers, but we're always happy to take calls and questions about what we do and how we can help you. Oh, one last thing, if you do generate plasmids, in papers, you can deposit before the paper is published. Um, we embargo the information until your paper comes out, but that allows you to use the adgene catalog number in your materials and methods, and then you don't have to describe the plasmid, because in PubMed and in ScienceDirect, that becomes a hot link to the map. So um, it's a really good idea to take care of that before you deposit, and, and many labs are doing that now. They deposit with us before they write their paper, um, and it makes it just much easier for everybody. Okay. So let's talk about work-life blend negotiation. There's no balance. I hope you've all figured that out by now. You're far enough in your careers. There's never balance. There's always stress. There's always excitement. Um, hopefully, there is some joy and energy as well. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. I do not mind being interrupted. I will just keep talking. So feel free to raise your hand, shout out, disagree with me. I love to be disagreed with. That's my favorite thing. So um, you know, we can talk about some of these things. These are purely my opinions, so um, there's more than one answer to this problem. So these are my 10 commandments. Oh, so this is really my work-life balance. That was your teaser work-life balance before. So um, I got married in graduate school. That was already weird. Getting pregnant in graduate school, that was really weird. I went into my advisor's office and said, Roger, we're, we're expecting a baby. And I got this blank stare. And I realized he had no idea if that was good news or bad news, <laughs> like none. And I said, Roger, we're excited. And then he was awesome. He was like, oh, yay, great work. You know, and he was incredibly supportive. He gave me time off. He paid me to work at home. I had to actually stay in the lab after I got my degree. I defended my thesis when I was six months pregnant, which was kind of fun, because it was sort of like, just try and fail me. Come on. You know, I'm ready. I'm ready. And uh, so that was kind of a pro forma thing. And then uh, he kept me around because I had this pre-existing condition I had to work through uh, on my insurance. So once that was all set, um, I, I went out into the working world. 
Um, I told you about some of my volunteer work. My kids are in college now. That's changed my work life blend considerably. So the first month after that happened, my husband and I did this thing. I'm going to stay late at work. Oh, yeah, me too. I'm going to stay late at work. I'll see you later. So we did that for two, three months. And then finally we were like, you know, we still have a family. We've been married almost 25 years, but we have, you know, hopefully 25 more years to go at least. And we better put some time into this relationship. And so we made a rule. We do actually try and come home and have dinner together as a couple. Um, and then we work more at the dining room table, you know, because you can work remotely anywhere these days. Um, but, you know, we, we stopped that kind of like, oh, we're going to skip dinner and not spend time together in the evening and come home so tired that we don't even talk to each other. Um, and occasionally we even go out to eat on a weeknight, which is like radical. It's a school night. And, uh, you know, so that's kind of new for us. Uh, my parents are aging. So I'm in a conference. I have my phone in my pocket and, you know, it's buzzing and buzzing and buzzing. And I'm giving a talk and I'm like in front of 400 people at an RNAi conference. It's my mother. She's broken her knee on the cruise ship and they're evacuating her to the hospital in Florida and then I have to and then they're going to fly her home and I have to arrange an orthopedic surgeon and you know some I mean it's like a nightmare right I'm at the, I'm not even home I'm like you know so um, that's not the only thing that's happened I've had responsibilities as my parents are aging and that's a whole different work life blend you know thing um, so, okay. Oh, and then, you know, I have other stuff I like to do. So this will come up later. I'm Orthodox Jewish. I never, ever work on Saturday. So I only have six days in my work week. Um, Saturday, we do not use the phone. We do not use electricity. We do not use the computer, my entire family and my children. Um, and so think about what that would be like in your life. We'll talk about that later. Um, it's awesome, actually. I don't know how people don't do it, frankly. Um, but I think I'd be totally addicted to my phone if I didn't turn off for 25 hours a week. Like, I'd be like a constant phone checker. I wouldn't be able to put it down. But it, like, breaks the addiction cycle of, of uh, media. So um, I read a lot of fiction. I read about a book every two weeks, kind of minimally, more on vacation. Um, and we like to travel. So other stuff we want to fit into our lives and stuff we want to do. So um, if you think that, you know, oh, I don't have kids, oh, I'm not married yet, oh, you know, everybody has work-life blend issues, right? Because you or your partner could have an illness and then you ha you're faced with issues. As I said, your parents could be demanding in a certain, in a different way. You have family obligations, community obligations. Maybe you want to run a marathon. You know, whatever it is that you want to do outside of the lab, there's going to be some strain because many of you are in situations where your advisors are telling you don't ever leave the lab, don't ever leave the bench. And so um, that's not realistic, actually, but, um, you know, it, there is always going to be that pull. Now, one of the funny things that, um, why I call it a blend is, you know, what do I read for pleasure when I'm at home? So I'll take a step back. One of the interesting things, when the government went on furlough, there were some very, did everybody know about that, right? Gov all the NIH scientists could not go to work could not use their email addresses at Agene. We, we actually, our sales went down. There was a whole, we, like a significant number of scientists were like not allowed to work. So what does that mean? Like there were a significant number of blogs about scientists saying, well, what does that mean? Can I not read papers? Like, do I not, you know, like w there's so much that we do that's sort of like, I mean, when we're sitting around, I'm reading nature. That's what's on my coffee table. You know, like, and oh, and I'm like, oh, wow, we got to get these plasmids. These look good. You know, like I'm always working because I like it. I like reading science. We're totally geeky. We have like aerospace, and then we have, my husband's a rock scientist, so he's like aerospace engineering and science and nature and Entertainment Weekly and The New Yorker. But, you know, like we have all the science around. And, you know, so what does it mean to not be working? So, you know, it has to do with, I think, attention and, and to your outside life that you have to think about. All right, so this is... Uh, Set up is my Ten Commandments, my Jewish upbringing. Like, I like things in, group, you know, two tablets of five. So um, I'm going to kind of go through my Ten Commandments. Again, my very personal choice about what I think is important as far as work-life balance. So the first thing is you have to be happy at work. So you spend an awful lot of time at work. E you know, and if you're in a bad lab, and we don't have time to really get into this subject now, but if you're in a crappy lab and you're in U two, two or three, I have worked with students and postdocs to get out of that lab. Because life is too short, my friends. You know, so if you are truly miserable, you should make a change with your life. If you truly hate what you're doing, you should truly not finish your degree. So I really like have pretty strong feelings about this. Because what happens to your other life when your work is crappy, because you're spending 40, 50, 60 hours working, is you're miserable. So your family is going to suffer, right? So I was never a stay-at-home mom kind of type. And as long as I was happy at work, my kids and my family were happy. 
I became like the witch mother when things weren't going well at work, you know, and that and the times when I was ready to make a change and move on. So, so some months before I left Abbott and went to a new job, I was just not happy. It was time to move, you know. And so when there are issues at work, your family's going to suffer from that. So it's really important that you find a place. I don't mean like every minute is like happy dance, you know. But like in general, you get up and you want to go to work and you're, fu you're fulfilled and you're learning and you're growing. Because I think for scientists, that's what it means. You have to be learning new stuff all the time, right? Maybe looking at data. But so um, it's really important, right? So you have to be really cognizant of what you're doing to the people at home by the emotions that are being elicited by your work. And that's just a consciousness thing that I think we all have to have. So sometimes um, work is more important than the non-work stuff. And you have to admit that you're going to do that because if you're going to succeed in your career, that is going to happen, right? So you can't pretend to your family that, oh, you always come first because it, you know, it just, of course, if there was an illness or something serious, you'd be there for them. You never want to miss that, you know, 100th birthday party because that's a once in a lifetime literally thing or you're going to be in deep doo-doo. But, you know, the rest of the things, sometimes you have to say work comes first. And I think that your family and, re and relatives and friends will respect you for being serious about your work, you know. And this means women, men, moms, dads, doesn't matter, okay. It's important for all of us to take our work seriously and show the people around us that it's important to us. So, you know, I didn't go to every violin recital. I certainly did not go to every swim meet, thank God, um, because that is the most boring thing in the world, and I'm sorry if you're a swimmer. Um, but I went to every other one. I took my turns. You know, uh, I taught my kids to drive. That, that fell on me. You know, like some of the things are going to fall on you. Some of the things are going to fall on your partner. Um, I don't call my, you know, sometimes it's my job to call my mother-in-law. Sometimes it's my husband's job. We trade off these things. It's, you know, we, we do it. We share that burden, right? And we say no to a lot of things, which I'll talk about um, in the talk, but we don't do everything that we can. And sometimes we just say, no, I have to be at work. I have quite a bit of travel now, um, and it's part of my job. I've had certain times in my life when travel's been a big deal. I didn't say no to those opportunities. I said, you know, um, we, are you traveling? If my husband wasn't traveling, I went. I did it because that's part of my job, and my kids understood that, that was part of my job. Okay, so I think it is really important to keep a very regular work schedule. Now, I am a firstborn, and I'm type A. I get that, but I worked 8.30 to 4.30 every day for, like, my first 12 years at Abbott, you know, because I had daycare pickup, so I had to do that end of the day, which meant I had to leave the building at 4.30. And by having that very... Now, it did not mean I did not work at night did not mean I did not take out my computer and do other stuff, but it did mean that my workday was very prescribed. The people around me just got used to it. They stopped inviting me to 4.15 meetings. I don't send emails at 2 in the morning. I draft them. I send them all in the morning. I don't want people to think that it's okay, you know, to email me at 2 in the morning because I don't want to be expected to respond to emails at 2 o'clock in the morning. I have a prescribed working day. Um, I, I chose a job, so one of the things about industry, this isn't a talk about industry academia, but one of the things about industry is that the hours tend to be more regular because there's a lot of people in the building who go home at 5 o'clock and it, sent, it lends itself to a culture of 9 to 5. Again, it doesn't mean that the career scientists are not working at night at home, but it does mean that the formal day when you're expected to be there is more prescribed than in academia when you can be in the lab till all hours, you know, or, or you know, in, the, in, in whatever you're doing. So, you know, it may be that your day is 7 to 4 or 8 to 10 or whatever your day is, but, you know, if you want to keep it regularly, people around you learn that that's the expectation. And this all is pre precluded on the fact that you're doing a good job and you're being successful at what you do because you've chosen the right thing to be working on. That's all kind of a given. You get this respect from people when you're doing your job. But I don't really think that necessarily spending more time at work is always the answer. Sometimes it's prescribing it and forcing your day into the time that you need. Now, I also, Sabbath in the winter starts at 4 o'clock, um, you know, and so I have to be home by 4 o'clock, which means I'm often leaving at 3 or 2.30 if I have some preparation to do. And I just tell my bosses that before I'm hired. This is the story. These are the holidays I need off. I have 6 to 13 Jewish holidays a year I have to take off. They're on the calendar. We know for the next 5,000 years when they are. It's all, it's, I'm not making this up, you know. So, you know, and, you know, I did, my, I did my work well. I prepared for those things by being a bit compulsive and knowing when they were coming, you know. But um, I just left. I left, I didn't ever let anybody, because I have to be out of the car and in my house by 4 o'clock, you know. And so that's what really taught me that you can do it, because that have to was enough. Like, so, so many times I had to walk out of a meeting and say, I have to leave, and you know what? The world didn't come to an end. Nothing happened. No, nobody died, because I'm not that kind of 
doctor, you know? So um, it really taught me that it's really important to work within bounds. So if you have a family, so these are a couple slides that do relate a little bit more to having a family or being in a group living situation, a partner, uh, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, you don't have to do everything by yourself. So if you are the type A personality that has like, you know, I have to do it myself kind of thing, you know, your career is going to suffer more than your partner's. You have to share the burden, okay? Now, I, I don't want to be gender specific here, but often the household tasks fall more onto the women and the child care. I just read a very interesting article about how, oh yeah, men are doing more in the home and that's good. They're more involved with their children and that's good. But it turns out that when they do studies, men do not do the high energy housekeeping. So I'll give you an example. And I'm rashly generalizing here, and if you are a man that does not, my husband, by the way, was not a man who did this. He did more of the childcare than I did. So um, I'm, I'm not accusing anyone. I'm just saying these are the generalizations that you should be aware of. So if you are standing in front of the TV doing the dishes for 20 minutes, that is a low energy, relaxing activity. Would most people agree with that? You don't have to be doing anything else. You're, it's not mentally straining. You're kind of watching the TV at the same time. Now, how about putting your kids to bed? High energy or low energy? Could be very high energy, right? So mom's putting the kids to bed and fighting with them and the teeth brushing and they're running around and they, you know, I need more water and, you know, I don't want to wear those pajamas. And you're washing the dishes and watching the TV and, you know, blocking it all out because men can do that. I don't know how they do it, but they do. You know, and so you're not really doing something fair. It's not really fair. So you have to be cognizant of that in your relationships and you have to start early being cognizant of what you're asking the, your partners, your roommates, the other people around you to do, right? So you can't really do it all alone. Um, I have female friends who will not like, let their husbands take their children to the doctor. Now, I don't know, my husband is a PhD aerospace engineer. If I had said to him when we had children, you're too stupid to take our kids to the doctor, I think I need to take care of that, I think we would not have stayed married. I think he would have been severely insulted. And in fact, he did most of the medical care for our children. Um, but the fact is, society is kind of asking, thinks that mommy needs to be there. So here's a true story, completely true. My son is four, Friday afternoon, of course. He walks into a door in daycare and he needs stitches on his head. He has like a little Harry Potter scar thing going on now. He's very proud of it. So, you know, I get a call. He needs to go to the doctor's office. It's not an emergency room, but they need to stitch it up. He needs a couple stitches. So my husband is on the Air Force Base where my son's in daycare. He says, listen, Go home and get ready for Sabbath. Go get dinner ready. I'll bring the kids to the doctor. I'll take care of the stitches. We'll meet you at home. No sense in the both of us going. So I'm not a very good with medical issues anyway, so I'm like, great, see you at home. So he's in the room with my son, and the doctor comes in. It's not our doctor. It's an older male doctor, and he's putting the gloves on. And the doctor says, okay, where's this child's mother? And my husband goes, I'm this child's father. And he says, well, I can't put stitches on if the mother is not in the room. You have to go to the emergency room. Have you ever been to the children's hospital emergency room? I don't wish that on anybody, okay? You don't ever want to go to the children's hospital emergency room on Friday afternoon. So my husband said, you are going to put those stitches in his head because I am not taking him to the children's hospital emergency room at 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon. And he said, all right, well, but if this child can't handle it, I'm going to stop mid-procedure and you are going to have to go to the emergency room. It could be a, you know, a, a cosmetic issue. It could be a problem. My husband's like seething. The nurses are watching steam. He's like, fam my son's famous for this, by the way, still. The nurses still talk about this. So, you know, Ben lies on the table, the doctor says, and my, son, my husband says to him, who knows his child very well, doctor's going to put a little medicine on your head so you can't feel it, and he's going to sew up the hole in your head just like mommy sews a button on a shirt. It's going to be all fine. And the doctor says, puts his hand on my husband, I, my husband's not a violent person, but I think this came, this came close, puts his hand, pushes him away and says, don't tell him that, you're going to scare him. As if my husband does not know that his child needs information, because that's what that child needs. And Ben sits up, pushes the doctor and says, oh, doctor, don't worry. If I lose a little blood, my body will make more. So that's the child of a scientist, right? But this guy, all of society was saying, daddy can't really help at the doctor because he is incompetent and too stupid and doesn't really know his child. Well, how insulting is that? So, you know, it's crazy, really. It's crazy to imagine. It still happens. It still happens, okay? So all I'm saying is you have to really share this stuff because otherwise somebody, somebody's career is going to tank. 
And you got to know about this before you get into a serious relationship. So what's happened with me and my husband is we've been lucky. We've both had great careers. He's a division head at Lincoln Lab of the engineering division. His last name's Nywood. You may have heard of him if you've ever worked at Lincoln or done an internship there. Um, and what's happened is our careers both grew in parallel, and sometimes I had to back off a little because he was doing busy, and sometimes he had to back off a little. But neither of us, like, ever stepped off. And so we were both able to get to where, you know, I'm running a company and he's running a big division, right? So what happens is if you don't do this carefully, you don't end up where you want to go. One person doesn't. It's not always the woman, but one person doesn't. 5% of the time it's the man. 95% of the time it's a woman. So you have to be conscious of these issues in your own family if you care, right? Okay. So now speaking a little bit now toward the women. So I'm rashly generalizing. But in general, for some reason, women are very nitpicky, okay? And so I don't understand why my husband does not see that a rectangular bath towel has four corners that match up. And when you fold that towel, it can be neat so that the nice folded side sticks out in the linen closet like mommy had it, and they're all stacked up pretty in the closet, right? So what happens if I get uptight about how nice the towels look in the closet? Who does the folding? Me, right? That's a crappy job, right? Who wants to always be responsible for the folding? So the first time I said to him, you're folding that wrong. Oh, that was it, right? He's like, you fold it, honey. I'm done with the towels, you know? And oh my goodness, fitted sheets? This is insane, right? How many people fight? Raise your hand and be honest. How many women can't stand to watch a man fold a fitted sheet? How many men know how to fold a fitted sheet? One, a couple, excellent. Yes, yes. So, yes, yes. So this is what we made the rule in my family. The sheets go off the bed, into the washer, into the dryer, into the basket, onto the bed, into the washer, into the dryer, into the basket. Nobody ever folds them. It's awesome, okay? Way better, all right? So because we never had to have this argument about caring about, you know, that the sheets look like that in the closet. So you really, if you're going to do work-life balance, this is really a big commandment. you got to let some stuff go, for goodness sakes, right? You can't have that. So I actually also discovered that my children don't care if their clothes are folded. So somewhere around 10 years ago, I'm like, oh, I don't even, except for red stuff, I don't really need to even sort into the washer, into the dryer, into the basket, into their room. They just use it right from the basket, back into the washer, back into the dryer. So I stopped splitting up the laundry. I taught my kids how to do laundry early. You know, that was great. My son said when he got to, you know, went away for his first year away, he's like, I'm the only one who knows how to use the laundry machine. I'm like, yes, that is the kid of a working mom, you know. So, um, you know, all I can say is you, sometimes you have to resist the impulse to control, you know. So here's another thing. And again, these are some, these do follow along gender lines, but I'm not, I know that it goes both ways. So if you have a partner, if you go out of town, do you leave food like in the freezer for him or her to eat? So like before I met my husband, he was eating just fine. He could take care of himself. We got married young, but no, he knew how to make pasta. So when I go away, I do not like spend a week before putting healthy food in the freezer. If they have pizza every night, so be it. I don't care. You got to let go of some of this stuff. You know, okay, so we do not have a protein, a vegetable, and a starch at every meal. But you are away at Keystone, and that's awesome, right? You don't need to worry about that. So sometimes you have to learn to let go and be a little less controlling because you can't be doing both of, you can't be doing all the work. You have to be splitting it, right? So this one is sometimes hard to do. And I'm sure that there, I know about the woman things because I'm a woman, but I'm sure there are male things where there are controlling issues as well. So, you know, my husband does all the check balancing. Why? because I don't really care if it's a nickel off and he can't stand it. So the first time I got yelled at for not putting a check in the checkbook and for being six cents off, right? I was like, oh, I'm done with that. You get to do that job now, you know? So 20 years, I don't balance the checkbook, you know, because that he could not stand to watch me do it, right? And I'm perfectly capable. I did it for my adult life for many years. I know how to balance a checkbook, okay. So sometimes you throw money at the problem. Now I realize early in your career, this isn't always an option. Um, but how many people have Amazon Prime? I have Amazon Prime. It's, it's gonna, price is going to go a little up. Still worth it. Still worth it. Um, you know, I don't go to the store at all anymore. Like we buy batteries. We buy like socks. You know, like it's just become it's just a huge time saver, right? So anytime you can use some form of money to fix a problem, um, it's a really good thing. Um, there were times when the the snow is falling. My husband's out of town. I have two little kids that I have to put in the car. And the guy shows up with bread, milk, and bananas, and i ready to kiss that guy. I would pay any delivery fee for that to happen, right? So um, whenever you can throw money at the problem. So I will tell you one sort of unique story that I know about this. 
Um, I have a friend who was the head of the Mass Biological Laboratories for a while. It's a nonprofit organization that makes antibodies for, um, uh, you know, um, uh, for c countries in need where there's need for certain uh, defense against rare diseases and, and tropical diseases. And um, she said that when she and her husband were postdocs, um, they had two kids. They both they had had two kids. It was the way that their life went. And they realized that for them both to succeed in their postdocs, they needed like super nanny. So what's super nanny? Super nanny lives in your house. She drives because that's usually involved in taking care of children, right? She speaks enough English that you can communicate well with her. She's available 24-7, and she's awesome, and your kids love her. Okay, that's super nanny, right? And so sometimes you need super nanny. You can't have daycare. So we managed with daycare because we had these very regular schedules, but, you know. So they took a second mortgage out on their house. They saw this as an investment in their future. If we can get through these tough postdoc years and both do well, and both get good jobs, we will be able to pay back this mortgage, which is in fact exactly what happened. So, and that was the only way they could afford to have Super Nanny live in their house um, and have a, a car of her own and all those things, you know. Um, so a weird out of the box kind of thinking, but sometimes money can solve the problem if you can access it in some way. Okay. So I come from a religious community, which is pretty uncommon in science and tech these days. You know, um, some people are still religious, but few people are still going to church and actively involved. I, I don't know that many people, young people, that are doing that. Maybe you are. That's lucky. Uh, maybe you have family in this city where you're studying. We go all over the place to do science now, and so we're often far from our families. This is very, uh, very strange in some cultures. So in some cultures, people live in their same town and their parents take care of their kids while they work, you know, and that's like the, the modus operandi, that's how it works, right? And then you come to this country and you have no safety net, you have no support. So in my religious community, a woman about a month ago um, got pneumonia, a single mother actually, and went into a coma unexpectedly. She has three children. Within 45 minutes, her whole family was taken care of. Um, her kids had been farmed out. Their house was being taken care of. Um, you know, people that didn't really know her that well just stepped in and took care of it, you know, because that's what a religious community does, right? Um, when someone in my community has a baby, gets sick, loses a relative, people I don't even know I'm cooking for, I'm making a lasagna, you know, because that's what we do. The call goes out, people take care of it, you know. So when you don't have that kind of community, especially when you're a student or a postdoc in a city where you don't have a, a safety net, um, one of the things that I've recommended to people, and this actually works, is to sort of create fake community. So what's fake community? So in a community or in a family, you just do stuff for people without expecting a return. So like when my sister-in-law calls me and says, you know, Danny needs to stay at your house tonight. I can't get home in time to pick her up. That's my niece. Um, it's not even a question. It's, she, just, she just does it. She just drops her off, right? I, she, I don't owe her anything. She doesn't owe me anything. I, she'll do the same favor for my kids someday, right? Or has done it many times in the past. So um, what happens is you have that, that, that that support network, you know. And so how can you create that? Well, maybe you're from a different culture. Maybe you're in Chinese school on Sundays. Maybe you meet six other families and you create a kind of fake community. Like, you know what? I, my, my kid is sick. I have an important experiment running. Can somebody cover? You have an email. Now you have email and text. It's like you have a lot of ways to reach out in an emergency to this group. So find a couple other families in your situation and really kind of work together to create that community if you don't have one naturally. I can't tell you how great it is to have parents and family around. That's how people used to do this. When everybody had to work, not just like working by choice, but when women and men had to go work in the fields, somebody was taking care of the children. They had a safety net to do that for them. We've lost that in our current day and age. So, you know, one night, um, one morning, Ellie and I, my husband and I get up, and I'm in a suit and he's in a suit, which was not so common early in our careers. I was wearing, you know, wore a regular clothes to lab, and, you know, I look at him and he looks at me, and my son comes in the room, stands in front of us, and throws up on the floor. And feel his head, he's got a fever, and I look at my husband, he looks at me, and I said, I'm giving a talk. And he says, I'm giving a talk. <laughs> and I say, I'm giving a talk to my boss. And he says, I'm giving a talk to my boss's boss. And I was like, oh, you win. So, you know, what do you do? You got to call, you, you know, I got to cancel it, right? So, but the next day, my father-in-law took a train from New Jersey and spent the next three feverish days with my son while my husband and I went to work because he was retired and he could do that kind of thing. And we had that safety net, right? So, um, you know, having a safety net is a huge thing. You, if you can figure out a way to create one, figure out a way to create one. Maybe you have some friends you could do this with, whatever it is. Yeah. Somerville have like a mutual name for you? They may. I don't know. Yeah. It's a great... 
Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, these are these looking for these communities, right, of people that you trust. So there has to be a little trust, right? You're going to leave your kids with these people, maybe, you know, or your dog, or your right, or your dog, or whatever your other, you know. Um, sometimes it's not even kids. It's, there's other issues that you need, you know, you need support for, right? So um, yeah, I mean, and and you know, you guys are all students in the same community, right? You you can bond with people here, and you're in you know in your in your community, right? But um, it really helps. I, I don't know what people do without it, frankly. Again, it's sort of like the Sabbath thing. I, I, don't, I don't know what other people do because so, so many times this has sort of come to my aid. Um, OK, so you have to foster independence in the people around you. This is kind of the same thing as the not being micromanaging, you know, like not uh, sweating the small stuff. So um, you know, if you stand there at the daycare and you cry with your kids how sad it is that they have to go to daycare, guess what? They're going to be sad they have to go to daycare, you know? But if you stand there and say, aren't you lucky there's pasta in the noodle table today, you know, or whatever, you know, like, you know, there are way better toys at daycare than there are at home, you know? So, um, you know, I never had, never once had the experience of dropping a crying kid off at daycare. Never. Okay, so um, it, it's partly you. That's all I'm saying. Some kids are shyer about daycare, some kids are not, but it's partly you. So you have to like be ready to be independent. So fostering independence is really important, um, including my parents, right? So sometimes now my mom calls me and I'm like, I cannot help you with that, mom. You know, I, I'm not. You're, I know the TV won't turn on, but you're going to need to figure that out yourself. You know, um, I cannot come to Stoughton right now. It's not going to happen. You know, so um, sometimes you just can't. You know, be answering to people, including fostering independence in your, in your partners, your children, and your, and your spouses. So my daughter actually, um, when she was about nine, she went to sleepaway camp for the first time. And I get a call from the camp mother. This is a thing they have now. Some older woman at the camp is, acts like she, you can go to her with your problems. She's the mother at camp. And she says, well, I just wanted to tell you that Tess has a urinary tract infection, but everything's fine. And I'm like, what is that supposed to mean? What do you mean everything's fine? Can I talk to her? You know, she's like, well, she came to me yesterday and she said, I think I have a urinary tract infection. And my counselor, who's 17, doesn't really know how to do anything about that. So I'm coming to you. And you know, I think I have it because I'm not drinking enough because I don't like how the water tastes. So here's $10. Can you go to Walmart and buy me a case of bottled water and one bottle of cranberry juice? Because I'm told that that helps. And I'm allergic to penicillin and, um, and sulfa drugs, so I take Cefso. So that's the only antibiotic that I can take when I have a urinary tract infection. She's had one urinary tract infection in her life. So sure enough, you know, she goes to the doctor, they have her tested, she has a urinary tract infection, he takes out her file, the big red flag, she's allergic to penicillin and sulfa drugs, you know, she needs to take Cefcil. And by the time they call me, she's on her second dose and she's feeling better, you know. So now how, that, and she's like a seven hour drive away in the Poconos, right? So now how much less stressful is that call than the, oh my God, you mommy, I'm crying, I'm screaming, I'm dying, I have a urinary tract infection, which is a horrible thing actually if your children call you and do that because it, it has happened when they've been sick or upset or something and it's terrible, right? So, so much better. I feel so much less worried that she can take care of herself, you know. Now, I am glad she didn't tell me about all the hitchhiking she did in Israel till she got back. That was good. I didn't want to know about that. But she certainly was self-sufficient enough to take care of herself in international travels at the age of 18. Right? So, you know, my son came to MIT, said it was hilarious. Some of the other freshmen, he calls me up, he, you know, he lives right near here, so it's not, you know, he says, they don't know how to take a cab. I'm like, what does that mean, they don't know how to take a cab? He's like, I have these guys in the frat, they've never, I'm sorry, fraternity, you know, I'll say frat here. Some of these guys in the fraternity, they've never taken a taxi. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, no, I'm serious. He's like, he's like cracked up by this. Like, he's had a $20 bill in his wallet in case he needs a cab since he was like 12, you know, like, so because I'm not home to pick him up and sometimes he would want to come home from school and he would need to get home and he knew how to call a cab and he knew how to take a cab, you know. So having your kids have some independence is like really helpful for them, for you, for their future lives. It's a good thing. Okay. So you have to have a to-do list and a to-don't list. And everybody knows this, right? But we don't always stick to it. So, you know, there's some things you just have to say no to to make room for the important stuff. And that may be the folding the sheets. So one of the things we said no to in our house was when you have um, kids in elementary school, especially early elementary school, they get invited to like 60 birthday parties at Plaster Fun Time or like the, the, the uh, laser tag, right? And they go there, they eat cake, ice cream, and pizza, and they get a bag full of crappy little gifts that's also full of candy. And there can be two of these in a day, right? So if you accept all those invitations to all those parties, you never, ever get to go on a family outing on a Sunday. Remember, we only have one day. We only have Sunday, right? So we just told the kids, you need to pick six friends in your class that you really are friends with, and the rest, we're not going to do those. 
you're just going to, we're going to RSVP no. And there was a little bit of a fuss, but not much. We just said no, because otherwise we never got to go hiking in the Blue Hills. We never got to go to the museum. We never did anything fun as a family, which, you know, we don't see them that much. We wanted to do those things, right? So you have to kind of be strategic in, in the no time as well as the to-do time. I'm pretty careful. I do a lot of volunteer work, but I only kind of do one thing at a time. Um, I'll say no. I'll say to people, look, now's not the time. You can come back in a couple of years and ask me again, but I'm not going to do that board now because I'm on this other thing, you know. So, um, and I don't stay on a board for too long. I turn over so that I can do different things with my volunteer time and with my efforts. So, you know, it's, kind, it's important to kind of say no to some of these things. Um, it, it really, it helps a lot. Okay, so you have to have fun. Now, if fun is the lab for you, then that's okay. Yeah, so that's the things that you don't do. So, um, I, you know, I have thousands of things I don't do. So, like, right now, I don't, you know, go to the AWIS board meetings anymore. I, you know, I don't, um, I don't go to the store anymore ever. <laughs> I buy everything on Amazon Prime. <laughs> you know, like this, you know, the things that you say no to, right? There may be work things that you say no to. Like, no, I'm not going to serve on that committee because I'm already on two committees and I have to leave time, right? I need to leave time. Um, you have to leave time for some of the important things. So like public speaking for people in STEM is very important. You, you have to be able to say yes to conferences. So that may means that you have to say no to something else, right? And, it, and the no things can be to your family. They can be at work. Um, there are just some things where you just have to say no, right? So it, it, you're always kind of, that's the balance, right? You're always kind of blending and trying to figure out what the most important things are, right, so that you can succeed. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So guilt, oh, I, I, did I talk about guilt yet? I don't know if I tell you, yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. You're allowed, right. So I don't know if I talked about guilt. So guilt is, like, I totally don't believe in guilt. I, did I, I don't think, maybe I'm not getting to that slide yet. I just don't believe in it. It's just, like, not okay. I, I, you know, so well, I, I, if we don't get to it, I'll talk about it at the end. For anybody. I just, I think it's ridiculous. I think guilt is ridiculous. Okay. So you have to have fun. Oh, here, no guilt, right? So you have to have fun. Um, so whatever those things are for you. So I love to do the New York Times crossword puzzle. I'm completely addicted to it. I was actually totally torn apart yesterday because our magazine didn't show up. My husband had to go find it online and like print it for me because I was like, ah, need the puzzle, you know. So that's fun for me. I find it incredibly relaxing. It's like my favorite thing to do is just to sit for 20 minutes with a pen and the New York Times crossword puzzle on Sunday, you know. So it, it, it's like a mental thing, right? Whatever, and, and I, I go to the gym every morning. That's not even a fun thing. That's like a health thing. So. I don't know how many of you find time to exercise. You kind of, you reach that age where, well, you always have to, really. You should always be doing it. But, so the only way I could ever exercise is in the morning. So I go at 5.30 in the morning almost every day, and I just do it, and just do it, right? You have to. So um, I, I think if you're just work, or work, or work, or work, and you're never doing anything. Now, again, if work is fun for you, and you don't need any release from the lab, then I'm not telling you, again, this is a blend. I'm not telling you to do something. So what, you know, what do we do for fun? Well, we go to the science museum. <laughs> You know, we're pretty geeky, right? So we do a lot of geeky. We play Scrabble, you know, like we, we're pretty geeky. So, but those are fun things for us, you know, with relationships with people. And so um, it's really important, I think. Um, so no email. So I'm going to ask a little bit of a personal question. How many of you sleep with a phone in your bedroom? Yeah. And what's your excuse for that? You need an alarm clock, right? Yeah, so I know an alarm clock is $8 at CVS. So let's assume you don't really need to have your phone in your bedroom. I'm going to make a radical suggestion that, especially if you have a partner, your bedroom is better used for other things. And especially if you don't spend much time with your partner, think about putting the phone somewhere. I do not, I'm old, I'm almost 50, okay? I don't understand. We go out and we watch people on dates talking, looking at their phones instead of talking to each other. I would never go out with a guy who did that to me ever again. I find that incredibly offensive, you know. Now, maybe this is because we spend 25 hours a week with no email at all, so we actually talk to each other and play things like board games, like Settlers of Catan, very low tech, but very fun for the family. Um, we eat meals together. Um, we, at, there's, no, there's no pressure to finish because there's no phone, there's no TV, there's no computer, so we eat, sit and eat for two, three hours sometimes, many courses and with friends and, you know, invited out. We will take a nap. What a radical Saturday afternoon nap. Have you ever have you done that in a while? It's awesome to have a big meal and then nap for two hours. It's awesome, okay? No phones, no nothing going off. 
It's a little hard to imagine, but if you really want to increase the quality of life with your non-work, with your family and with your relationships and with your friends, just try it once. Try it one, try one Sunday where you just turn your phones off and leave them at home and go do something. Um, it's very hard the first time because you're all pretty hooked, but um, we do it every week so it gets a little easier. But okay, so if you can't do that, think about making some space in your life for time when you really talk to your partner. Because that's a hard relationship to maintain when you're busy. I know a lot of scientists who are divorced. I know a lot of scientists who don't make it. Sometimes it's just because you didn't nurture that relationship. Relationships need nurturing. You know, it, we, it's not always, you know, hunky-dory. People are busy. People are tired. Stuff happens. Um, and some, some people don't belong together. But if you don't give it any attention, it, really there's, there could be a problem later on in your life. So you have to kind of decide, you know, what, what your values are about spending time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about guilt for one second before I finish up. So my feeling is society is like giving people guilt about stuff all the time. And you know, you have a right to enjoy your career and you have a right to have a non-career non life as well. So if your advisor is giving you guilt about not being in the lab, maybe you should have been more careful in choosing your advisor. So you know, I have a whole talk on how to choose a lab. Sometimes that involves, you know, does, when you go into interview, does the advisor have any hobbies or does he or she spend all of his or her time in the lab? You know, that may be a bad thing actually if you want to have a life. So you need to like be cognizant of these things when you're choosing a supervisor. It's pretty important, right? So that guilt is not okay. And I don't think that the guilt that you're not taking good enough care of your children is okay because I truly believe that if you are happy, your family is going to be happy. So if you are happy at home, you should stay home. I would never have been happy at home, so I went to work. That was the way it had to be. You know? And when I was happy, that was good. So I don't really think guilt, like, what are you guilty about? Like, I don't understand that. Like, I'm not doing a good enough job as a mother. I did the best job I could and tried to keep my family happy. I think that's the best that you can do, right? And you don't have to be there all the time for that to happen. So I, don't, I think it is non-productive, and I think you should work through those feelings and um, get rid of the guilt, because it's not helping. It doesn't help you, it doesn't help your family. Um, so there's a lot of p things you could read about this if you're interested. Um, one of the most famous things to read um, is, um, let me see if I can find the right, uh, How Will You Measure Your Life by Clay Christensen. Um, he has a YouTube and a paper of this topic, but also a quick YouTube thing that um, if you're sort of thinking about that setting your values and your priorities for your life, you know, he's a kind of very visionary speaker on this topic. He's an excellent speaker anyway, but, um, you know, he's a management consultant who's quite famous. Um, and he came out kind of publicly and talked about his own uh, family life and his own values and, and judgments about work-life balance and work-life blend. So it's definitely worth the read. It's, it's quite a classic. Um, and this talk is actually in a webinar format on Bite Size Bio, but it's also being recorded here um, if you want to recommend it to everybody, to anybody. And most of the, the things in this blog, um, in this talk, are also in this blog. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff online if you want to read more. And all these things have different ideas and different tricks for dealing with um, the issues of work-life blend. Um, but the bottom line, again, most of them come to the same conclusion, is we all deserve to be happy. We all deserve to work if that's what our vocation is. And we all deserve to have a life outside work. So sometimes the choices we make have to be made for those reasons so that we can balance both those things. Um, and that is my last slide. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take any more questions. Disagree with me? Questions? Yeah. I don't know that this is exactly how you answer during that question. Mm -hmm. Having a, a good three years of respondent's life as a matter of law. And I'm not sure I did it the best way. I'm not saying mm -hmm. I did. But um, I was around a lot. It did cost me mm -hmm. severe life. Yep. But I also saw other parents who hired somebody who wasn't real interested in Right. I don't, I don't believe that the time that you spend loving your kid, you love your kid every minute of the day. You don't have to be with them to love them. I don't believe that the time, I don't believe that the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so there are also a lot of studies. I should put more data in this talk because this isn't really a talk data, this is a gut talk, but I have data talks too, this is a gut talk. But there's a lot of data where, you know, you might think that the children of working parents, for example, do worse in school or have more emotional issues, and it turns out that is not true at all. There is no data to support that. So all of the data say that if the parents are happy and balanced, the children will be happy and balanced. So I don't think it matters the, the, it matters the quality of the time that you spend with your children, not necessarily the quantity. And if I had been home, it, it would have been, my children would not have been happy with me home because I would have been miserable all the time. I will tell you that my mother got married at 18. Um, so my own personal experience, again, this is not data. This is you know, uh, my own personal experience. My mother got married at 18. She should have been a brain surgeon. She was a very, very bright woman, but she got married young and supported my father as a medical technician while he um, got his degrees and went on to work. She never worked, sort of, she had little jobs, but never worked formally, did a lot of volunteer work. Um, and you know, somehow in my family, we always knew that she should have been the one working and it would have been better if my dad were at home. Uh, she never made us pay for it, but I will tell you that their marriage and our relationship would have been much better if she had. She would have been happier. She spent her whole life getting credit. I only remember is my mom saying, I should get credit. I knew that was the right thing to do. She always wanted credit. And now I look at that and I see that what she really wanted was acknowledgement of her intelligence and her talent. And she, her, she expressed herself through her being a wife and a mother. But really, she would have been a lot happier as a brain surgeon. And we knew that. And it affected my relationships. It affected my, her relationship with my father. Um, and so I have one, you know, again, anecdotal, you know, evidence that it, that's where I come to the decision that it's really important that you're happy. Not that, not what you do, but it's how you live. And, and I think being happy is important. If you're unhappy at home, it's not going to make a difference how much time you spend because you're going to be a bad mother or father for that matter. So other questions? Mm -hmm. You got to, right, you got to, so, I mean, it's a little late for me. You look like you're not in your first year, so you're not choosing a lab, right? Um, you know, I don't, I mean, this is a lot, you have to vote with your feet, right? Choose a lab that, that is reasonable. In the, I'm not saying you don't work hard in grad school. I did my 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. time points. I liked it. I was a scientist. It was fun. I wanted to see what happened. I was willing to stay through the night sometimes, you know. But, um, you know, there has to be some acknowledgement that there are other important things in your life. And sometimes you may be a month where all you do is work in the lab. That just means that the next month there's going to be some payback. You've got to rebuild your relationships. And, you know, I'm not saying I didn't work late. I'm not saying I didn't call my husband and say I'm not coming home. I worked hard to get to where I am, right? And there were times there were trade-offs. And, and um, if I would have been happy at home, it's lovely to stay at home. Believe me, going back to work at nine weeks with my, after I had my daughter, that was terrible. That was too early. That should be a law. Like, you should be able to be home for 12 weeks. Nine weeks is not enough time to get better from childbirth. I had a healthy, natural childbirth, but it's not enough time. So that's just like a problem in our country with it. You know, and missing 12 weeks of work in a whole career is nothing if you're a good worker. Hiring someone takes more work, right? So it's just kind of ridiculous. that This talk is not about gender issues, but that's a huge, like, problem, right? I mean, it's not about those type of gender issues. It's a huge problem. So women really suffer because they have to have the children, and it's ridiculous, right? So, because otherwise, who's going to have the children? Only uneducated people? I don't know. I don't understand. Like, that's kind of where we're going. So, um, you know, it's, um, so, so there are times. So there have been times where I have not had time to exercise, and I'll go a week, and I'll be like, I've got to get back to the gym, got to get back to the gym, you know? But um, so things have to give, right? You do make priority decisions, right? But I don't think it's reasonable for anybody to say that you have to be in the lab all the time. I just don't, I don't think that's reasonable. And I think if you set that expectation, right? If you set that expectation, that's what people will expect from you. But if you leave and say you do your work and you do it well and you work hard while you're there, um, you can get good science done. I don't think you need to be there 24-7 to do the, a reasonable amount of good science, right? Yeah. So is that what you guys got from this talk? 
Okay, no, so no, no, that is not at all. I'm so sorry, I have to rewrite the talk. So absolutely, there is no time in your life. Life is too short. There is no time in your life when you should have to say goodbye to your family or, good, or I, I'm going to give up at work. Right? So it may mean you have to slow things down a little or you make slight, slight choices to, in delaying. Maybe you take a little longer to graduate. But I don't think there's ever been a minute in my life when I haven't been serious about my work, incredibly serious about my work. And there isn't a minute of my life when I haven't been incredibly serious about my non-work activities. I get to have both. So you, you can't hold one for the other for five years. You'd be miserable. I'd be miserable. Right? So one of the things that happens, and again, this is you know, the way the world is going. I, I see it in the young people at Agene, right? They don't get married until they want to have kids. And so they don't have kids for a really long time. And then when they want to have kids, and I see this among scientists, and I'm sure you know people, they're too old. Because having kids is biologically a young person thing, you know. So if you put your whole life on hold because you're in grad school and then you're a postdoc and then you're waiting and you're, you know, you, you got, there's a biological problem there. We have to find some way to be able to do both things because otherwise we're just, again, only the people who don't have PhDs are going to procreate. And that's really a bad thing for society, you know. So I, I, think, um, I, I think you can't wait forever to do those things and say, oh, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait. You have to be able to do those both. Yeah. So that's, I, I can't answer that question for you. It may be that you do a math. I, I did it. We were. Yeah, so I, I again, I, to me, I would not have given up having my children. It's easier to do when you're younger, physically easier, right? Um, so it may mean that you have to trade off the timing of things. Um, I can't speak to your financial situation. That is a challenge. I, we, had, we, had, we were both in graduate school. We were both graduate students when we got married and had kids. Um, it wasn't so easy. Um, but um, we did it and we, we squeaked by until, you know, we got to where we had, and slowly we made more money because we did okay together, you know. Um, but um, I, I don't, I, 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 I feel very, very bad for people who wait until they're 45 to try and have children and then they can't because that's a sad, now, if you don't want to have children, that's, that's good. That's, that's a good thing to do, and then you, you don't have to worry about that balance. I'm not advocating any one path for anybody. I'm a very diverse person. I don't believe in that. But, um, you know, the, it is a choice that you're making, and you can't just slide by and not think about it. So that's what I hear a lot, is people don't think about it, and then they wake up, and they're at the end of their postdoc, and, you know, they're like, it, it's, it's, their lives are in a weird place, and then they want to have kids, you know. Mm-hmm. It did. It did. It was a choice for me. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I had a very fulfilling career in science and industry, so, and I, I have a talk on this if anyone's interested. I, I like, I think it's very important to have academic scientists, but 65% of you will be in industry. Uh, if there's engineers here, probably even more. Um, when you, um, you know, it just, there's no room for us all in academia, so it's going to happen. Um, I think I know thousands of people who have very happy careers in non-academia. It definitely affected my choice to go directly to industry and not to postdoc. So to answer to your question, that was a monetary question, a monetary choice that I made because I could not afford daycare and I did not want to stay home. I knew it was the wrong thing. I, I, there's not a lot of things I knew, but I knew that staying home was not, a right, was not the right thing for me. So. I couldn't afford a postdoc and afford daycare. Could not. Yeah, that's definitely that was definitely a choice. That was a choice. No, no, it had nothing to do with that. It, it had nothing to do with. I wasn't worried about that. It was. It was. I knew I wanted to go to industry. I had already made that decision. Um, and but I did. I wanted to do a postdoc because I think it's a good thing to do to broaden your network and learn a new skill. And but I couldn't afford that, so I went directly to industry. Yeah, that was definitely part of that decision. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> and I'm so convincing, aren't I? <laughs> so I never worked on Sabbath. Oh, so the question is, did I think differently um, when I was younger? Um, and more in the thick of it than I am now, and my kids have moved out, knowing everything's so easy, right? Um, 
So uh, did I think differently? Well, I don't think I would have made any different choices. I'm not upset about having not done a postdoc. I had a very fulfilling, great career in science. I worked at the bench for 12 years, loved it, you know, then got to do other cool stuff. Biotech for four years, it was great. You know, now I'm in nonprofit, I love it. Um, I love working at Agene, it's a great place to work. Um, so I don't, I, I think it just opens different doors. There isn't one path for anyone. Um, would I have ever done anything different as far as my children? I would have had one more maybe. You know, um, I, I, when, when that second one got out of diapers, we both went, oh, we can't do diapers again. And we just kind of made this default decision. We had a boy and a girl, you know, it was all good, you know, but I have to be honest with you, I would have had one more. Um, you know, love my kids, love that they're, they're the light of my life and, uh, you know, I'm so proud of them and they bring me joy all the time. So joy is, is what I'm going for here, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I was really lucky with my family. You know, again, maybe my religious life affected this. I don't know. I have a very active religious life, which lends itself to time with family. Um, so that was prescribed for me by my choice of staying religious, uh, which was a choice. My family is very diverse. We have some people who did, some people who didn't. You know, um, so um, and it's a very personal choice. I don't, I don't advocate. I don't, I'm not a proselytizing person. I'm not saying you should be religious, but I am saying that some of the aspects of my religious life uh, showed me what I think are important values, you know. So literally, I mean, do you spend a day a week paying attention to your partner or, or family? You know, nobody does that. So it's a little bit about quality time, right? You can spend time. I, I, I go to the soccer games. I see those guys with their phones where their kids are playing soccer and they're doing this. They're, is that quality time? I don't think so. Sitting at the, the swim meet, this is not quality time, but sitting at the table for three hours talking with no phones and no TV and no distractions and just talking and eating together, that's quality time, right? So um, I, I think uh, I was forced to do it, but there's huge value in finding that time. So I don't, I don't think I would have made choices different. I mean, there's plenty of things I would have done differently, just tweaked maybe, but you know, as far as how, when I had my kids or when I, what I did with my career, um, I don't have any anything to regret, I don't think. Yeah. Um, what did Jesus say more about how you should not live with filth in your life? Right. I don't know. I guess I'm just so stubborn, you know. I'm so bossy. Like I, like I just don't understand why anyone could ever tell you how to spend your time. Like I'm not telling you how to spend your time here. I'm telling. I'm asking you to think about how you, you know, certain things that are valuable. So like I never like when my mother tried to make me feel guilty. I'd be like, Are you kidding? Like I'm the greatest daughter in the world. I'm your daughter with a doctorate. Your other kids don't have that. You need to leave me be. You know, like I did that for you and I took that in my maiden name so you'd have that doctor thing, you know, and the boys didn't do that, you know, so no, I'm, I'm kidding. But, you know, I, I, I think uh, you have to look at the bright side of the great stuff that you're doing and the great things you do for your family. You don't owe, I mean, do I feel like, do I wish I spent more time with my family? You know, sometimes I do, but I, then I make my best effort. I can't fit it all in. I have my own children. I have my parents. I have a career that I'm, you know, have made commitments to. Um, there's, those things are all important. And what, what is guilt about? You just do the best that you can. So I, I just, I, I get it. I get that people have that. And it's like a universal thing. But I just don't see how it makes any sense to feel guilty when you're doing the best that you can. What else can you do? You know, and everybody's different what their best is. Everybody's different what their energy is. I mean, what happens? You're going along, everything's good, and all of a sudden you have an illness. So uh, Saturday, a week ago Saturday, I, w I had gotten back from a week away, which is always a bit iffy for me because I have a bad back. So six hours in the plane on the way home from San Diego. I bent over and threw my back out. It's only the third time it's happened. I have a weak bulging disc, and every so often it goes. So Wednesday night, Tuesday night and Wednesday night, I was speaking, once at Tufts, once at BU. And then Thursday night, I was getting on a plane for Philadelphia to spend the day at the University of Delaware Career Fair. So three speaking gigs in that week that people were dependent on me showing up, right? Or the events would have to be canceled or find a new speaker, right? So I literally hurt my back and walked into my bed and laid on my back for two days because I had no, what was I going to do? 
right? I had to get better as fast. I had to see if I was going to get better. I didn't know. I had to send emails like, I might not be better. You should think about a contingency plan. You know, I cannot move right now, you know. But I did, I had stuff, you know, I was supposed to be somewhere Saturday night. I canceled it. I, I, I hurt my, you know. So we, we, we tend to like realize it's okay to do something when you're sick. But sometimes you just have to make those choices and say no, because it's just right. You know, it's just like you've pushed the limit. You know, there's mental health as well as physical health, right? So nobody would, if I, and then I had, I was supposed to be at a, a board retreat on Sunday and I called the board chair, I'm the vice president of this board, and I said, I am not going to be able to be there. I'm sorry, I helped plan this retreat. I, I have to stay on my back. I'm in too much pain. I need to be as better as I can, right? So he totally understood, right? Because you're injured, you're sick, you're, you know, and God forbid any of you should have a serious illness or your partners, right? Because then your whole life balance is going to change because you just have to deal with that. So for me, I feel like it's the same thing when you're making choices about what you do for your mental health, right? It's, it's not a thing to feel guilty about. You just do the best that you can, right? Now, if you're not doing the best that you can, then that's your, that's your choice. That's different. But doing the best that you can is doing the best that you can, right? So, yeah. Right. So this is kind of a big, like a big topic. I don't think I can do like, you know, standing up here. Um, but you can read a ton about this, you know, like we'll start with Clay Christensen's article because it's a really good one. Um, you know, of, again, you're going for the joy and you're going for the joy on all fronts. So the only thing I can say is you try, you have to try and make choices that allow you to be happy, not frustrated and not hurt the people that you're around. Right. So that may mean slowing down, speeding up. It may mean you're willing to kind of throw caution to the wind for a few years and just ramp up, you know. It, it may mean if you really ask tough questions, it's not important to you to do that, that you maybe you want to. So, you know, I took a pay cut to go to nonprofit, you know, but I'm so, I love it. I love every minute. I'm like so excited to be at work all the time, you know. Um, but, you know, biotech was really fun, but I didn't want to do that again, you know. And so right now, I may be again later, but... So, you know, you, you have to kind of be very introspective. Like, being busy is not necessarily going to make you happy. Being, being higher title is not necessarily going to make you happy. So that's just like an introspection career kind of thing. You have to know what it is. that. So what makes me happy? I love to look at data. Any career, any job that I have, I have to be looking at data. I love data. I love designing experiments. I love interpreting papers. I love looking. That's like the thing about science that I really like. Is it doesn't matter if I make it with my own hands or like. So when I got promoted to group leader and I no longer had time to work at the bench, I was a little nervous because I was going to have all these ten people reporting to me and I wasn't going to have time to do any science. I like doing bench science, but it turned out when you have ten people reporting to you, you have ten people's data. It's like data bonanza. You get to look at data every day. I was never happier, you know? So, you know, for me, that's like a key part of work. I have to be looking at data and I have to be working in a group. I do not like to work by myself. I like to work on team projects. I like, you know, I like to motivate a team. I like to be working with people, over people, under people. I like that whole, you know, so those are like the two things that I've discovered by a lot of introspection and a lot of tools and activities and mentoring stuff that have to be part of my job. And so when I look for positions, that's the first things I look at. Am I going to be looking at data and am I going to be working in a team, you know? Um, and I need to be learning all the time, but that's pretty much true of all of us, that if we're not learning, we get bored, so. Well, thanks for coming. I'm going to stay around if people have other questions for a few minutes. Um, so good luck with your choices, and um, I hope this gave you a lot to think about. And come to watch one of my other talks that's more skill building. This one is more thoughtful. So take care. <laughs>